Welcome to a Stormy Podcast, events, ideas, and realities where we explore the stories shaping our world and beyond. Today, we're diving into the explosive congressional hearings on UAPs, unidentified anomalous phenomena, or as most people know them, UFOs. These hearings are uncovering startling evidence from military encounters to whistleblower testimonies, sparking serious questions about what's out there and what's being kept from us. The military evidence brings the topic to a whole new level of seriousness. We'll break down a few key moments, discuss the evidence, and ponder the implications for science, security, and humanity's place in the cosmos. We've broken this into two episodes, with this first one being a little more focused on the hearings themselves. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, this is a conversation you won't want to miss. Let's get started. There's heavy weather. All right, let's jump right in, shall we? UAPs, they're everywhere in the news these days, and there's so much to unpack. We've got congressional hearings, brand new books, and some uh, some pretty wild theories floating around out there. Definitely a lot to dive into. Yeah, and we're going to tackle it all head on. We'll start with that recent congressional hearing on UAP. It felt like a pretty big deal, wouldn't you say? Having former military pilots and intelligence officers testifying under oath. I mean, that's not something you see every day. Right. It definitely felt like a turning point, you know, bringing the whole UAP issue into the mainstream. Absolutely. OK, so let's break down the key takeaways from that hearing for our listeners who might have missed it. What were the most important things that came out? Well, I'd say the credibility of the witnesses was huge. We're talking about people who have a lot to lose by coming forward. Yeah, these aren't just random folks calling into late night radio shows. These are pilots, military officials, people with serious reputations. Their testimonies carried a lot of weight. Exactly. Like Commander Fravor, for example. His description of the Tic Tac incident back in 2004 was pretty mind blowing. Oh, yeah, the Tic Tac. That would really grab my attention. Just to recap for our listeners, Fravor described seeing this Tic Tac shaped object off the coast of California. And the thing seemed to just disable the radar systems on his F-A-18. It's pretty unsettling when you think about it. Totally. And then you've got Ryan Graves, another former Navy pilot, yeah. talking about how UAP sightings were practically routine during training missions. Right. Off the coast of Virginia, Graves said they were encountering these things so often that it actually became part of their pre-flight briefings. They were talking about UAPs as potential safety hazards. Wow, that's incredible. It wasn't just a one-time thing for these guys. It was practically part of their daily routine. It seems that way, yeah. And Graves actually went on to form Americans for Safe Aerospace, a platform for pilots to report these sightings without fear of being ridiculed or, you know, having their careers jeopardized. Makes sense. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to speak out about yeah. something like this, especially when it's been so taboo for so long. Definitely. And then, of course, you've got David Grush's testimony, which was, well, pretty explosive. Yeah. Grush dropped a bombshell, didn't he? For those who haven't heard, Grush is a former intelligence officer, and he claimed that the U.S. government has been running a secret UAP crash retrieval program. For decades, he says. They've been collecting and studying crashed UAPs, maybe even reverse engineering technology from them. That's some serious X-Files stuff right there. It sounds like something straight out of a science fiction movie. I mean, the implications of that are huge. Absolutely. And Gress claims he's given classified information about this program to Congress and intelligence oversight officials. So it's not just some wild theory he's throwing out there. Wow. OK, so we've got credible witnesses, multiple pilot sightings a former intelligence officer alleging a secret crash retrieval program. This congressional hearing was a lot to take in. Was there anything else that stood out to you? Congressman Burchett, the one leading the hearing, actually revealed a previously unseen photo taken by a Navy pilot. Oh, right. I remember hearing about that. It showed a large orb-like object over the Gulf of Mexico. And get this, the pilot said the object seemed to be messing with his radar and sensor systems. So another case of UAP interfering with military equipment. That seems to be a recurring theme here. Yes. And Burchett was adamant that this pilot was very credible, you know, top notch record. And this object was like nothing he had ever seen before. OK, so multiple pilot sightings, a brand new photo and a former intelligence officer claiming the government has recovered UAPs. That's a lot to process. It seems like we're finally moving past the era of just dismissing this stuff as a bunch of crazy stories. Yeah, I think that's right. 
This hearing definitely felt like a sign that things are changing and the government is starting to take this issue a lot more seriously. It's about time, wouldn't you say? I think so, yes. If you'd take just a moment to like and subscribe, we'd very much appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, so we've covered the highlights from that congressional hearing. Now let's move on to some other fascinating sources. You mentioned Luis Elizondo's book, Imminent, right? I think that's a perfect place to go next. Yeah, let's dive into that. Mm. Elizondo was, of course, the director of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. He's been a leading voice in this whole UAP discussion. Absolutely. His book offers some really interesting insights into what was going on behind the scenes at the Pentagon. All right, well, let's unpack that then, shall we? Yeah. So Elizondo's book, what's he saying? Well, he really dives into the aftermath of these major UAP events, you know, like the Nimitz Tic Tac incident that Fravor talked about in the hearing. Yeah, multiple pilots see this thing, radar picks it up, and then nothing. No official investigation. Exactly. Elizondo kind of suggests this is part of a bigger problem, you know, like a pattern of the government being secretive about UAP stuff. Okay, but why, though? If it could even be a remote possibility of a threat, wouldn't you want to figure it out? You would think. But Elizondo doesn't really have a clear answer, although he does imply there are some powerful groups keeping this stuff quiet. Ooh, that sounds a little spooky. Mm -hmm. But not totally unexpected, I guess. Right, this whole topic has been shrouded in secrecy forever. Uh. But, you know, the book doesn't just talk about cover-ups. He also gets into these really wild ideas about how their technology works. Oh, here we go. This is the good stuff. Mm. Alien tech. Let's hear it. What kind of theories does Elizondo have? So one of the big ones is that some of these UAPs might be using technology that can actually manipulate space time. Hold on. What, like bending reality kind of stuff? Yeah. Oh, that sounds a bit far out, even for me. I know, right? It's like something out of Star Trek. But Elizondo actually cites some legit physicists who have theorized that advanced civilizations might be able to do this, like manipulate gravity, even create wormholes. Okay, so trying to picture this. If they're messing with space-time, that could be how they make those crazy moves we keep hearing about, right? Like those instant accelerations, the right angle turns, all that. They're basically breaking the laws of physics as we know them. Yeah, exactly. It's like they're playing a different game altogether. That's pretty freaky. Makes you wonder what their whole deal is, you know? Yeah. Like, are they just curious tourists or is there something more to it? Yeah, that's the million-dollar question. And Elizondo even brings up this term, initial preparation of the battlefield. Initial preparation of the battlefield. That's a mouthful. What does it even mean? It's a military term. Basically, it means assessing the terrain, the enemy, all that stuff before you make a battle plan. And Elizondo is suggesting that maybe all this UAP activity we've been seeing, especially around military bases, could be a form of reconnaissance. So like they're scoping us out, seeing how we react. That's not exactly comforting. Not really. And then there are these reports Elizondo mentions of people experiencing weird physical effects after encountering UAPs. Wait, what? Like getting hurt by these things? Yeah, like burns, radiation sickness, even some psychological stuff. Seriously? I hadn't heard about that. It's pretty wild. There's not a ton of data on it, but enough reports to make you think there might be something to it. Man, it's like every time we learn something new about this UAP stuff, it just opens up more questions. It's a real rabbit hole. And we've only just started going down it. Well, speaking of rabbit holes, earlier you mentioned something about crash retrievals. Let's get to know more about that. Well, Elizondo touches on it a bit, but there are other sources that go way deeper into that, like Ryan Wood's book, Magic Eyes Only. That's a whole other can of worms. Crash retrievals. That sounds like some serious Area 51 stuff. Yeah. Magic Eyes Only. <laughs> Okay, I'm intrigued. What's the scoop on this crash retrieval stuff? So this book is basically like uh, a massive compilation of all these references to crash retrieval. This is from where? Everywhere. Witness testimonies, leaked documents, historical accounts. He's got it all in there. And, well, he makes a pretty convincing case that the government, you know, maybe even other governments have been recovering crashed UAPs for like forever. Forever. Really? Like how far back are we talking? Decades, at least. Maybe even longer. Wow. Okay, so what kind of details? Does he give any specific cases? Oh, yeah, tons. Like the one in Santa Rosa, New Mexico, back in 1963. There are all these witness accounts, even some from, like, medical people. Medical people. What were they doing there? Well, the story goes that this small disc-shaped craft crashed in the desert. And get this, people said they found small, like, child-sized bodies in the wreckage. Whoa! 
Hold on, child-sized bodies, that's pretty creepy. I know, right? Super creepy. And then, supposedly, the Air Force just swooped in, took everything, the bodies, the whole shebang, and basically threatened everyone into keeping quiet about it. That's wild. Do you think there's any truth to it? Hard to say. It sounds pretty out there, but the fact that these stories keep popping up is, well, it's pretty interesting, to say the least. Okay, what other cases does he talk about? Oh, there's that one from 1964 in Cherry Creek, Nevada. People saw a big glowing thing come down near a train carrying copper. It hovered over the train cars for a bit, and then, are you ready for this, some of the cars just vanished. Vanished, like poof, gone. That's insane. Yeah, and they were never found. It's like they just disappeared into thin air. Wow. That's nuts. So Wood's book is just full of these crazy stories, huh? Yep. It's one wild ride, I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, and then he also talks about these flux liner designs supposedly leaked by this guy named Brad Sorensen. Flux liner? That sounds like someone out of a comic book. What are those? So Sorensen claimed he worked on this, like, super top-secret aerospace project where they were building these advanced craft based on, get this, designs from crash UAPs. He said these flux liners could, like, manipulate gravity and fly at insane speeds. That's like reverse engineering alien tech. This is getting pretty wild. I know, right? A lot of people don't buy Sorensen's story, but if it's true, Oh, man, that's some next-level stuff. It's definitely mind-blowing to think about. All this talk about UAPs being extraterrestrial, it just makes me think about the Fermi paradox. You know, if there's all this life out there in the universe, why haven't we found any solid proof yet? Yeah, it's a big question. Where is everybody? Right? It's a huge universe. Statistically, there should be other civilizations out there. Maybe they're just really good at hiding, or maybe they've seen what a mess we are and decided to stay far away. Could be. Or maybe interstellar travel is just insanely hard, even for super advanced beings. Or, you know, there's this idea of the great filter, this uh, this barrier that wipes out most civilizations before they can really get out there and explore. A great filter, huh? That's kind of scary. <laughs> what kind of barrier are we talking about? Well, it could be anything, really. A natural disaster, a self-inflicted catastrophe like nuclear war, or maybe something we haven't even thought of yet. The point is, most civilizations hit this filter, and, well, they don't make it through. So either we got super lucky and already passed the filter, mm -hmm. or it's still out there waiting for us. Yikes. Yeah, it's a sobering thought. And then you throw in the whole multiverse theory and things get really wild. Oh, yeah. The multiverse, that's a whole other level of crazy. Right. Basically, it's the idea that our universe isn't the only one. There could be countless other universes out there each with its own set of laws, its own forms of life even. It's like a, a cosmic landscape of possibilities. So like those superhero movies where there are different versions of ourselves running around. Kinda, there are different interpretations, but yeah, that's one way to think about it. And if there are all these other universes out there, then maybe some of these UAPs are actually visitors from those other realities. Interdimensional travelers. Yeah. That's wild. I mean, that would explain a lot, right? Like how they seem to break the laws of physics. But then why don't we see more of them? Let's think about it. Our universe is massive, right? Like mm -hmm. finding a specific grain of sand on a beach. And if interdimensional travel is really rare or difficult, then maybe these encounters are just, well, incredibly rare. That's a good point. It puts things in perspective. And I guess if they have technology that can manipulate space time, then our current ways of detecting them might be completely useless. We wouldn't even know what to look for. Exactly. We might be totally blind to their presence. Man, we've covered a lot today. Crash retrievals, the Fermi paradox, the multiverse. I feel like my brain is about to explode. It's a lot to take in for sure. So what's the main takeaway here? What should our listeners walk away with? I think it's that we're at a really exciting and maybe a little scary point in our understanding of, well, everything. We've got more evidence for UAPs than ever before. The government is finally taking it seriously. And scientists are asking some seriously big questions about what it all means. It feels like we're on the verge of some major discoveries. But who knows what those discoveries will reveal or what they'll mean for us. That's the big mystery, isn't it? It sure is. But I have a feeling this UAP saga is far from over. Who knows what the future holds? Only time will tell. So... That's part one. We hope you found it interesting. Maybe interesting enough to jump over to part two, which is a little more of a free form conversation. And we hope you've subscribed. We appreciate the help. Wherever I
Thanks for joining us on this journey, folks. And until next time, keep those eyes on the skies.